Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast, and oh my word, it's 2020! Can you feel the fail already? I think we've got quite a year ahead, but for now, let's do our 2019 year in review. We saw a lot of important issues this year, beginning with the shutdown of Backpage and the personal section of Craigslist, culminating in the passage of SESTA-FOSTA, the first really big threat to Section 230 conduit protections online outside of copyright. But not only was it unnecessary because it resulted in zero sex trafficking charges, and the fact that Backpage was shut down before the package of SESTA showed the law was unnecessary anyway, police all over the country came out in the ensuing months to say that the shutdown of Backpage was making their work harder, since they now lost an important investigative tool as well as the cooperation that Backpage was giving them. And they immediately turned around and used FOSTA as an argument to attack encryption, the new line being that encryption protects child sex traffickers. They blamed internet platforms for the proliferation of sex trafficking and child porn, even if those platforms were actively helping law enforcement catch criminals. Even worse, we saw evidence that Craigslist's erotic services pages being shut down were linked to increased murder of women. Feminists were silent. It was an interesting year for cryptocurrency as well. Following the criticism Stripe has had in the past for denying people access to payment systems for political reasons, something that the financial system was made ostensibly to prevent, their refusal earlier in the year to allow payment processing for a cryptocurrency gift card company really drove home the need for permissionless payments. But as we also saw, there were problems as well, like when the founder of Canadian Exchange Quadriga CX died and left everyone else without the keys to the cold wallets, locking up over $250 million in money owed to clients. The company subsequently went bankrupt. We also followed the hilarious failure of Craig Wright as his efforts to prove that he's the one and only Satoshi Nakamoto have failed so miserably he's really the one person on the planet that we can definitively rule out. Not even his desperate copyright claim on the original white paper stood up to any scrutiny. He also lost his prominent defamation case against Bitcoin Cash cheerleader Roger Veer. He was even found to have committed blatant fraud and perjury in a court proceeding with the estate of his late business partner. On a more hopeful note, we saw directly the benefit cryptocurrencies can give beleaguered countries like Venezuela, whose government has hyperinflated the currency to the tune of 10 million percent in 2019, according to the World Bank. People all over the country, mostly in coastal areas and particularly in the capital city of Caracas, have been turning to the Dash cryptocurrency for everyday payments such as buying lunch. And we saw during the blackouts that cryptocurrency can even be a savior there. While the regular payment system was down, the Dash text service, which is a real benefit in a country where 60% of the population doesn't have a smartphone, allowed people to continue to make payments via text message since the cell phone service never went down. We also saw how Elliptic was actually fighting cryptocurrency crime, putting the lie to the claims of politicians that crypto enables criminals. Of course, this came right as a bunch of exchanges starting delisting privacy coins, particularly because of South Korea's anti-money laundering laws. But we did see a lot of innovation, particularly with two cryptos we've been watching. The first is Dash, which, in addition to payments over text messaging, have innovated secure instant payments which are also instantly respendable, a first for cryptocurrency, as well as chain locks, where blocks are locked in the chain and can't be altered, even by a 51% attack. Dash has continued to make innovations throughout the year, culminating in a new Dash platform which hit the testnet December 30th and is something to keep an eye out for in the coming year. The other is BitTube, where we saw not only a lot of crypto innovations, but also a ground-up redesign of their independent platform and the ability for any website or web user to accumulate airtime elsewhere on the web, easily the most disruptive passive monetization model I've seen. In more general cybersecurity news, it really was the year of the ransomware as it began hitting school systems and entire cities. We saw the ransomware riders getting clever, asking for ransoms considerably less than the costs of recovering the network from backups. That's made worse by the insurance companies who now have to face the decision of saving money by paying up and emboldening ransomware hackers or refusing to pay and paying for extensive restorations instead, raising premiums for everyone. 
We also had big breaches like the Capital One breach and all the buck passing that happened in its wake, including blaming cloud service providers and even a lawyer trying to sue GitHub for enabling hacking. Another big issue was the push by major tech companies for encrypted DNS, which drew ire from governments throwing another tantrum about going dark, as well as from ISPs who would no longer be allowed to snoop on people's browsing habits and even sell that data, as some have been caught doing. Trump's AG William Barr also vocally called for the banning of end-to-end -end encryption, and he went even further than those in the past. He said it was needed not only when looking for specific information via warrant, but for warrantless surveillance in the name of, guess what, finding child porn. Is it just me, or is anyone else worried about how obsessed they seem to be with it? So, of course, we have to talk about the recipients of Biggest Bogan Emitter and Idiot Extraordinaire, particularly the repeat offenders. Getting the year's very first idiot extraordinaire was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Paul Krugman, and Matt Iglesias. All repeat offenders. And that was alongside biggest bogan emitter and repeat offender Donald Trump. So we kind of saw what we were in for. Ocasio-Cortez became a repeat offender for the year when she got in a Twitter feud with a fact checker and narrowly avoided getting some others, such as when she got behind the Green New Deal and went all narcissistic on critics saying, I'm the boss! It was only the activities of people even worse than she is that saved her. Joe Biden became a repeat offender when he claimed that if elected president, he would cure cancer, and then followed it up by lying about Section 230 to turn people against it. The EU really geared themselves up as a four-time offender, beginning with the copyright directive that basically said you had to pay a license fee to be able to summarize or even link to copyrighted content, including news stories. The so-called Article 13, as we covered repeatedly, basically mandates sophisticated filters on websites to stop copyrighted material from being posted by users, despite denials by politicians. But guess what? It was lobbied for heavily by Audible Magic, the company that's in the best position to sell filtering technology to websites. There were also a lot of problems with GDPR, which resulted in bizarre things like the removal of public trash cans at the general post office due to privacy concerns. But none of them, as it turns out, could hold a candle to the Trump administration, just one of many examples being when ICE had been caught setting up a fake college in order to bust immigrants who were trying to stay in the country legally, something that, it turns out, went back to the Obama administration. And that was hardly the only one. In fact, Trump and his administration and departments all total racked up 14 biggest bogan emitters and idiot extraordinaires in 2019. That's got to be some kind of record. Other big news in 2019 includes the continued persecution of Julian Assange, particularly in April when Ecuador illegally revoked his asylum and police stormed the embassy and took him away. He was found guilty of breaching the Bail Act, but was kept in prison even after he finished his sentence. Why? Because the U.S. government wanted him extradited to the U.S., exactly as feared, and as the state apologists had been denying this whole time. Chelsea Manning was even jailed again after refusing to testify against him. By the way, the Swedish rape charges that started all of this and were ostensibly the whole reason for the thing? Dropped. Assange continues to be held in Belmarsh Prison, a supermax prison where the worst of the rapists and murderers are kept. Both his physical and his psychological health have been severely compromised, and experts, which include an open letter signed by more than 60 doctors, say that his life is in serious risk because of conditions he's been subjected to, calling for him to be moved to a secure hospital. Here's hoping we hear better news about him in 2020. And what a year for gun control bogosity, huh? The Democrats tried to close the ammo loophole by supporting mandatory background checks for every bullet purchased. Kamala Harris should at least get points for brutal honesty when she said the Constitution shouldn't be able to get in the way of her gun control agenda. Whereas Gun Owners of America produced more evidence showing that guns save lives every single day. That's probably why a group of students in Colorado walked out of a vigil for a school shooting when politicians and the Brady campaign started pushing for gun control. New York Democrats proposed a bill that would require social media searches for every gun permit. 
We saw the government pitch a fit over 3D printed guns, including the blatant entrapment of one of the pioneers of the technology, Cody Wilson, who was charged with soliciting a miner on a website that doesn't even allow miners. The funniest example has to be the London police bragging about all the weapons they confiscated, which included a rusty spoon. Of course, there was a lot of bogosity in the wake of the tragic Christchurch shootings in New Zealand, including deliberate misinformation in the press about the shooter, who was a leftist eco-terrorist, and the banning of his manifesto, as well as YouTube taking down basically any video that went through it to show what he was really saying. Can't have anything contradicting that media narrative! The FDIC actually admitted that they had been using Operation Chokepoint to discriminate against gun dealers, terminating their access to banking services under the guise of stopping money laundering. They had been doing the same thing with legal marijuana shops. And now the Supreme Court has allowed the case from the Sandy Hook family lawyers against Remington Arms to go forward. More wanton destruction of basic common law conduit protections. And just before the end of the year, so we didn't have a chance to cover it, was a would-be mass shooting at a church in White Settlement, Texas, where two men were tragically killed by a gunman who was almost instantly killed by one of at least five people in the church who were carrying firearms. No doubt about it, he picked the wrong place to try that. The only question for 2020 is, will anyone learn the lessons all of this has taught us? Of particular interest is Virginia, which has just passed extensive gun confiscation legislation which sheriffs and even National Guard members have said they're going to refuse to enforce. Should be interesting. Various other news items, we also saw more incredible bogosity going around about the so-called opioid epidemic. As we've covered repeatedly, people who become addicted after getting prescriptions are practically non-existent. Less than 1% of those prescribed, and overdoses of these are almost unheard of. The addiction and overdose being people who get their drugs from the black market, and particularly from those who think they're getting heroin, but are actually getting much more potent fentanyl. In fact, the DEA, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the news media racked up a joint biggest bogan emitter when pharmacists and pharmaceutical distributors were arrested. Yet another example of conduit protections being worn away by an increasingly intrusive and tyrannical government and a completely complicit news media. Yet again, the blame for this falls on the war on drugs and the politicians who wage it, and no one else. On a similar note, we saw more bogus fear-mongering about vaping. The FDA didn't even decide to wait for evidence before banning flavored e-cigs from the market on the basis that children were attracted to them when the evidence says that no such thing is taking place. In fact, despite the claims that vaping leads to smoking, vaping has been shown to be a significant part of historically low smoking levels. And also, our old favorite bogosity spreader, Salon.com, praised San Francisco for banning e-cigarettes because they cause popcorn lung when it's long been shown that they don't. There's been the race for the Democratic presidential nomination, about which really the less said the better, but a lot has already been said in line, so just search it if you have the strength. As it is, I think there'll be plenty more to cover as the election year progresses. Also, I think the Jeffrey Epstein stuff has been covered to such a degree that you don't need me recapping it. But one of the biggest fails of the year has to be the complete flop that was the Democrats' three-year investigation into Donald Trump colluding with Russia to rig the 2016 election, which failed to produce any evidence at all. This led Democrats to switch gears and saying he was really colluding with Ukraine, one of Russia's biggest enemies. It was because of the investigation into the energy company where Hunter Biden was suspiciously given a board position he was completely unqualified for. But since Hunter Biden's father is Joe Biden and Joe Biden is running for president, it's interfering with the election. It's always been amazing what you can get away with when you have an important politician for a parent. Now, if that important parent is running for president, you can get away with it even more. Up to, apparently, impeachment of the guy who just wants to investigate it. The other case for impeachment, by the way, was Trump refusing to testify in front of the House, something he is under no obligation to do. We can look ahead a bit to 2020, not just the election, but also things like COPPA, which is already causing disruption among YouTube channels fearful of being mislabeled by the FTC as targeted at children and heavily fined. 
Yes, there's been a lot of competition, but before we reveal who our major idiot was this year, let's cover the 2019 recipients of the Silver Cluon Award. Sadly, there were only two. The Missouri legislature won it on 24 March 2019 when they declared all federal gun control laws to be void using state nullification, which Thomas Jefferson called the rightful remedy. And Peter McCormick won it on 28 April when he exposed Craig Wright's laughable claims to be Satoshi Nakamoto in his response to Craig Wright's cease and desist letter. And before we name the winner, we also have an outside nomination. Forum regular Dallas Wildman nominates James Comey. Linking to a Fox News video, he says, You'd think after an IG report revealing how totally unjustified the continued surveillance of Carter Page was, James Comey would at least apologize to Mr. Page. Instead, Mr. Comey goes on TV and brags about how he's been vindicated. Yes, we can agree that the IG's report is Hanlon's razor writ large, but it is not a vindication. You still effed up, Comey. Seriously, you have to be a grade A sucker to make Fox News look like they have more integrity than everyone else. Good point, Dallas. But really, when it comes to Idiot of the Year, there was one that stood out above all the rest. The perennial pain in the ass that is the state of California. In addition to their participation in stories we mentioned earlier, back in January, the LA Teachers Union pitched a fit about how many parents were choosing charter schools. Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders supported them fully, as did Ilhan Omar and the now irrelevant Kamala Harris. Then, in April, the very same politicians who voted for a gas tax increase, giving California the highest gas tax rate in the country, dared to blame the free market for their $4 a gallon price, and demanded an investigation. The very next week, they tried passing a blatantly unconstitutional bill to keep Donald Trump off the California ballot in 2020, when there's not any danger of California's electoral votes going to Trump anyway. Then, the California DMV showed how secure they weren't when a hacker jokingly got the vanity plate null, and they started sending him all sorts of tickets that weren't his just because their idiotic system kept matching them. We saw directly why California's housing crisis is so bad. One example, a guy who wanted to turn a laundromat into an apartment building was stopped by San Francisco politicians. To make matters worse, California politicians are trying to solve the problem by increasing rent controls. How is that supposed to work? San Francisco also called the NRA a domestic terrorist organization and said that other states and cities and even the federal government should do the same. Then they bizarrely started engaging in a war on freelancers, as they put severe limitations as to how much work freelancers could get, even if the freelancer wasn't in California. This will have a huge effect on freelance journalists working for California companies, as well as companies like Uber and Lyft. Every time we turned around, it was just one idiotic thing after another. So there's no way anyone other than California could possibly have been 2019's Idiot of the Year! Well, that wraps up 2019, and take my advice, keep your bogon shields charged, because 2020 looks like it's gonna be a doozy. Regular podcasts continue next week, so thanks to all of my co-hosts, thanks to all of the donors and patrons, and as always, thank you for listening. Until next week, here's a quote from Tim Slagle. I love California. Whenever someone has a really terrible idea, California tries it first, mercifully sparing the rest of us. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Bogosity.